Welcome to the Naturally Healthy Pets podcast. Let's get to it. Welcome to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Judy Morgan, and my guest today is Rachel Fusaro. She's a nutritionist and dog mom, and she helps curious pet parents get informed about pet food, enrichment, and positive training methods. She has a huge social media platform and gets lots of great information out for pet parents, which is amazing. And Rachel, welcome. Thank you very much for agreeing to be my guest today. Absolutely. I'm honored to be here. So today we are going to talk about uh, good behavior and how nutrition revolves around that. Um, and so, and I know you do a lot of rescue work. I've done a lot of rescue work over the years. And uh, I, I know that most of the dogs, I work with one rescue that all dogs must be raw fed. So, uh, and they're not, if That's you awesome. get a dog from them, you're not allowed to use any uh, chemical insecticides or parasiticides. You're not allowed to feed kibble. And so, but that is a very, very rare uh, rescue to find. All the others that I've gotten have come in with their box, usually of maggot filled, uh, stale, rotten kibble. Uh, and it doesn't even make it into my house. And then these dogs are coming with, um, just a, a laundry list of problems. So, um, so give us kind of what you have seen in the rescue world. Are you, mm -hmm. do you work with a specific rescue or just yep. a, kind of a lot you do? Okay. I do. Yeah. There, there's a few that I've volunteered with. I've been on the rescue board, foster uh, board member uh, from the largest Labrador rescue in Texas. And then right now I'm doing a lot of work with a poodle rescue, basically a mutt yeah. rescue <laughs> across the country um, and helping out there. But yeah, I, I think it's interesting how, you know, I've been in the rescue world for over a decade at this point, have fostered over 60 dogs and just recently had my first foster fail, uh, which is wild. Amazing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I love her. She's my world, this Marlo. Um, but it's always been interesting how I, I bring in these dogs. Uh, I foster them, rehab them, and they always have, of course, health issues and, of course, some behavioral challenges. And as an organization, as a system, I find it boggling that one of the last things that we consider, if considered at all, is nutrition and what how the nutrition is impacting the microbiome, which impacts behavior, because we now have science and research that suggests that there's absolutely a link between behavior and nutrition, which I'm excited to talk about. Um, awesome. But yeah, it's definitely boggled my mind, especially because we know that every surface of our dog and our cats, for that matter, body has a microbiome. Of course, the largest portion and most diverse is in the GI system, but it's so interlinked to our dog's stress and anxiety and aggression that in my opinion, I want to make it mainstream that we think about training our own personal dog, whether it's just we want to do leash training or if we're trying to rehab a rescue that we're thinking about nutrition forefront. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, shelter medicine and rescue medicine being what it is, um, whether these animals are strays or owner turn-ins, kind of the first thing that they're hit with is they, you know, usually get a, a kind of a quick physical exam, but they're hit with a myriad of vaccinations. So they're usually getting, I, I know the last one that we got through a shelter, which is not usually what we do. Um, but we took this dog from a shelter and his first day in the shelter, he was given uh, five vaccines and oh. a lot of those vaccines were multivalent. So like the DHLPP, there's a lot in that one shot. Mm -hmm. And he was given Brevecto and he had a heartworm test and was given heartworm medication. And so, and being fed, uh, you know, dry kibble, whatever was, was donated. So when we're getting these dogs, their microbiome is, their gut health is destroyed from all the chemicals, the vaccines, the poor diet and, and stress, just, just the stress of being in a shelter environment is also stressful for them. Um, so we know we're getting them with sort of a disaster. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think, 
it's also interesting to even go down to, uh, and this again applies to not even just rescue and shelter dogs for those that, you know, are, are pet parents and just trying to set their dog up for success. But when we go down to the hormonal level, because we know that hormones obviously influence behavior. But what I think a lot of people I don't hear talk about is the fact that there are certain essential nutrients uh, that help regulate hormones that dogs have to get from their food. Um, and I think that that's something that I become kind of passionate about, especially when we think about like protein and different types of protein, which I, I am going to ask you about in just a little bit. Um, <laughs> cause there's, there's a question here. It might throw us for a little bit of a loop. I want to ask you, um, but all of this influences behavior. There was a study in 2007 out of Australia that showed when we think about bioavailability showed that, um, foods that are, that go through high extrusion, high heat, low moisture have nutritional, um, impairment. It's adversely impaired. Sure. So it absolutely shows that like what we feed our dogs and the type of food that we feed our dogs, uh, is dictating the bioavailability of those nutrients, which I think is important. Um, and absolutely. even, even more exciting, uh, I was looking up research the other night and, from my alma mater, Oregon State University, where I got my nutrition science degree, they, and I'm sure you saw this study in 2019, they, researchers found that there was a link to the type of bacteria found in aggressive dogs, varied th from aggressive dogs to non-aggressive dogs, which really mm -hmm. suggested that what we feed our dogs obviously can influence behavior. I think they found that aggressive dogs I had a higher abundance of, I'll probably say this wrong, but of the bacteria Firmicutes. Uh, and then mm -hmm. non-aggressive dogs had a higher abundance of Fusobacteria. So I found that that's interesting because we can feed our dogs in ways that kind of can promote the growth of some of these bacteria or inhibit, which I think is great. It also showed, right. and this is makes complete sense, that fiber content and giving enough fiber in a bioavailable source can impact behavior. Right. Well, uh, fiber sources are the prebiotics for the probiotics. So yeah. if we have inappropriate prebiotics, then we can be feeding the wrong bacteria um, and, again, getting imbalances depending on the level of fiber that's in the food. Um, so, I mean, th there's just so many things proving that nutrient bioavailability is minimized by that high heat extrusion, high processing. I mean, dry kibble that is extruded goes through multiple heat processing steps because you've got the rendering process and then we dehydrate that into a meal and then we mix all that together and put it th through the extrusion and then we uh, dry it to dehydrate it even further. Um, so there's not a whole lot left, but that's why kibble has this long list of, uh, vitamin mineral supplement that's mm -hmm. added in because we know we've, we've, we've destroyed everything that was there naturally. Yeah. Um, so on that note of, so we, we get it right. Uh, behavior is influenced by what we feed them is influenced by microbiome. So some of the things that I've seen over the years, I was kind of making a list of like, okay, so what are some of the behaviors that I've noticed in dogs that even just based on science could easily be linked back to, to nutrition. And some of the ones I found, and I'd be curious if you've seen any others, uh, for those that are watching and wondering, Hmm, I wonder if my dog is, is, is struggling with their microbiome health, uh, counter surfing. Um, dogs that are constantly trying to get um, access to our food, dogs that are digging or eating soil might have a lack of minerals, um, trying to eat rocks, chewing on furniture. What else did I put on my list? Oh, eating feces. Of course, we've talked about that a lot um, over, over the last few podcasts that we've done together. Uh, dogs that are hyperactive, dogs that are uh, anxious, aggressive. These are all things that I've seen over the years that have kind of gone, okay, obviously there's some behavior issues, right? There's some just gen based on their environment and their, and how they were raised, but obviously food can really impact that because food impacts how hormones are regulated, impacts, uh, the minerals that they're getting. And as we talked about before, the bioavailability, have you seen any other behaviors that have really right. struck out to you? 
Well, I mean, we get, it's certainly aggression, frustration. I mean, there's so many things that play into it, and we can, you know, take it a step further and look at it from a, you know, Chinese medicine food therapy standpoint yeah. of how we're impacting them and their personalities. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I I adopted a cocker spaniel who was 14 years old, came with infected everything, ears, eyes, skin, you name it, yeah. fleas, horrible, urine scalded. And uh, his worst behavior, uh, if, well, he couldn't see, he couldn't hear, but his worst behavior is he would go out and literally dig up my potted plants oh. to get the soil. Yeah. He also came with just about every intestinal parasite you can imagine. And so he literally was out there trying to replace one, his microbiome with the soil, the soil-based uh, bacteria, but he also was out there trying to get iron and uh, you know, fulvic acid and some of the minerals that he was missing because he was not absorbing his nutrition because he was, had such a heavy parasite load. And we see that when we have poor nutrition, those are the animals whose immune system isn't working as well. So they're the ones who are going to get, you know, every parasite that, uh, and interestingly, I didn't run a stool sample on that guy when I first brought him in, which, you know, kind of dumb. I should run a stool sample before I ever put them with anyone else. And that guy pooped all over my yard, pooped out every parasite you can imagine. Oh. And none of my dogs got sick. Nobody ever had a positive stool sample. One, we were pretty good about cleaning up, but two, a healthy animal is not going to have an infestation. Interesting. So he had a lot of behavior quirks and he was, uh, he was really interesting. Like when his diet was going well and his iron levels were up, he stopped eating soil. And then every once in a while, he would head out the door and go right for the potted plants yep. and the gardening soil. And I was like, your iron and B12 is a little low again, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think it's fascinating because I feel like a lot of people that will be listening or watching this, they understand the value of a fresh food over an ultra processed food. But I know that all of us at one point, either the past, currently or in the future, will have some kind of behavioral issue or challenge that we're going to work on. And sometimes I think it helps to step back and go, okay, it may not just be because they're naughty or trying to act out. Sometimes they're deficient in something. And sometimes it's not nutrition related, exactly. but a lot of times I believe it is. Uh, and yep. I love that you brought up TCM. Obviously you are more equipped than anybody to talk about that, but <laughs> through you, I've learned how food provides uh, energetics in a sense to our dogs and impacts the energy in our dogs. It can provide uh, warming, cooling, moisture, drying, um, and that's really influenced the way that I've fed my dogs. I think I heard you once say that it's like eating watermelon on a hot day. Uh, it cools yep. your body and adds <laughs> moisture. And that really changed the way I looked at my dog's food because like a lot of your listeners, I was feeding what I thought to be the best diet, raw food, all the great supplements. But I didn't think about at first, well, wait, how is this protein impacting the energetics of yep. my dog, of my very hot dog yep. that I was feeding, heating hot proteins to, you know, th those are things I didn't <laughs> think about. So I find that really interesting. Yep. It can make a huge difference. We need to take a break okay. to hear from our sponsors. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about some other things that go into behavior with our uh, pets. Um, and we keep saying dogs, but a lot, the, most of this, 99% yes. of it also applies to kitty cats because we do have behavior problems in kitty cats as well. So stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few moments. If you're listening to this podcast, we know you love your pet and clearly care about their well being. But are you also tired of watching them suffer from digestive issues like diarrhea, vomiting, chronic itching, gas, or GI symptoms with no obvious answers? You're not alone. We all want our pets to live happy lives and feel good. The question is how do you know if they actually are? Health starts on the inside. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Innovative Pet Lab's revolutionary gut health tests. These simple at-home tests give you invaluable insight into what may be causing your pet's symptoms and enables you to take proactive steps to help them thrive. Innovative Pet Lab's gut health tests are so easy to use. I've done them myself. You simply collect a stool sample, mail it to the lab, and within 10 to 14 days when the results are ready, you'll receive a detailed digital report. 
Once you receive the results, Innovative Pet Lab also provides recommendations based on your pet's results. From diet and lifestyle changes, to supplements, to veterinary consultations, you'll be armed with the information you need to make the best decisions for your pet's well-being. Gut health is a crucial issue for pets. It not only affects their digestion, but also immune system function and even their behavior. A healthy gut means a happier, thriving pet. So whether your pet is showing active symptoms or you're just wanting to be a proactive pet parent, head over to InnovativePetLab.com and order your gut health test today. As a special offer for listeners, use the code Dr. Judy at checkout for an exclusive 15% discount. Give your pet the gift of a happier, healthier life with Innovative Pet Lab. Don't miss out on gut health tests for 15% off using code Dr. Judy at InnovativePetLab.com. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Judy Morgan. My guest today, Rachel Fusaro, is a nutritionist and dog mom. And we're talking about um, how behavior and nutrition are intertwined. And she's done a lot of rescue work and worked with a lot of rescue dogs. So we know that the microbiome is really impacted by the food that goes into the digestive system. Um, but I want to talk about something else, uh, enrichment toys, uh, snuffle mats, and I, I, all these, like, the, I've used the toys where you hide treats in them and the dogs have to kind of do the little maze and puzzle to get them yeah. out. Um, do you think they actually help, like, as far as uh, with behavior and uh, training and, like, your rescue dogs? Absolutely. I think that, well, my answer to that is there's a fine line, in my opinion, in my experience, <laughs> between enrichment and frustration. And right now, yeah, right now, enrichment toys are trending. It's really exciting to think about. We can fill up this toy with food or treats and then give it to our dog. And then we can go off and scroll on our phone or just kind of, you know, let our dog get enriched <laughs> without us. So, and I've fallen into that as well, right? I have, I have all the enrichment toys to try them out. Uh, but what I've learned with them is we really need to be watching the be the body behavior behavior uh, of our dogs to see if they are getting really frustrated or if they are actually getting enriched. And a couple of the things I look for is if my dog is really kind of aggressively going after the toy. Let's say it's a puzzle. Um, my my one poodle Finnegan will take a puzzle if he gets frustrated and start throwing it around, and flipping it upside down. <laughs> And that's when I know, okay, he's not really set up for success there. Um, or if I give my other dog a frozen Kong with food or topple, and they're just going at it and like biting and biting and biting. To me, if my dog isn't about 50-50 mix of licking calmly with a little bit of biting and nibbling and then licking calmly, if they're instead literally trying to gnaw it off intensely and their body's tight and they're not loose and, and wiggly, that to me is they're more frustrated uh, than enriched. That is very, very good to to point out um, because I think, you know, I being a person who likes puzzles and things, you know, then you get to the point on your Rubik's Cube where you just want to throw it through a window. Yes. Um, and so I could see our dogs getting the same way. I cannot use snuffle mats and those treat toys in my house because I have five dogs and uh, that's when they decide that they want to eat each other because yeah. everybody gets very possessive. Yeah. And I, I've even tried where it's like, okay, we have multiple toys going and they're all like, no, I want his, I want his, I want hers. Like, mm. so we, we just don't do it. Even, even with, um, like longer term chews, um, I have to separate everybody for those. Yeah. My dogs have not learned to share. Yeah, it's a, it, it's definitely <laughs> difficult. I mean, you can always put them in different rooms, but when you have five, it's like you've got to have a lot of bedrooms to be able to do that. So that that would be. <laughs> oh, we have, we have with the raw meaty bones. It's you get that bathroom, yep. you get that bathroom, <laughs> you go outside. You go outside. Here's a here's a little <laughs> fence divider. It it is tough, and honestly, you don't need to spend any money on any of those enrichment toys to give your dog enrichment. My my favorite thing and people see this all the time, are doing sniff walks, sniff mm -hmm. um, I think my biggest thing with those, a lot of people will ask me, well, how do I give my dog a sniff walk sometimes? But then other times I want them to heal with me, right? Like I want them to walk with me without pulling. And for me, it was really easy to teach in that 
I just put a cue to where I'd say, okay, go sniff. And then when I say go sniff, my dog gets to go freely. I actually prefer to use at least a 10 to 15 foot lead leash if I'm going to be using a leash. Uh, I find six feet doesn't give them quite enough room to really go and sniff and explore. And then when I'm ready for them to heal, I just kind of go, let's go. And then I just ask for a heal and we work on heal. So for those that are just starting this, I'm like, I just say practice always giving cues before doing each. And so they start to learn, okay, when mom or dad says go sniff, I get to go sniff and freely. And I let them do whatever they want as long as they're not yanking me over and they're not eating something they shouldn't. Uh, and then when it's time to go into a heel, uh, I just pull them or just kind of call them back to me and we just work on a heel and reward that. And after a few sessions, they, they start to get it. Yeah, they do. Uh, I, we took both of our youngsters who are now two, both of them went to the puppy basic manners yeah. class. And that was one of the things we worked on. Like right now we are working and you're to stay by my side mm -hmm. and you know, you're not going to trip me and cross me and all that. And then they were given a command that they were allowed to just kind of, you know, free range a little bit, which I think the snafaris are really, really important. I don't usually take my dogs on snafaris because they the, get to sniff yeah. around the farm and in their yard and sniff all kinds of good things. One of the little buggers, he was trying to get to some donkey poop oh, under a gate tasty. and yeah, tasty. Well, he worked at it hard enough that he actually managed to wiggle himself under the gate. And next thing I know, he's out in the field with the donkeys and donkeys will kill them oh. because they're very protective okay. of the herd. Luckily, they were very distracted. They had just been given their hay and they were distracted and they were like, yeah, dog. <laughs> 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 Little bugger. So, yes, be, uh, be careful because when they're looking for that enrichment, they may find their way where they're not supposed to be. And that all comes back order. to what we were saying earlier is like if we just take a minute and just watch our dogs, a lot of times they're going to tell us what they want or need. And that actually leads me to my other mm -hmm. favorite enrichment activity, which is giving our dog agency or autonomy, like giving them opportunities to make their own choices, but obviously us keeping them <laughs> safe, like the best we can. Sometimes yeah, bad ones. <laughs> we just got to help them, help them stay safe. But like one of the things I've actually more recently, the past year started doing in mealtime, kind of bringing it back to nutrition is giving my dogs choice of what they want to eat. And you could do that just by putting food on a flat pad platter, the mind pet platter, just, just, you could use like a plastic um, cutting board or wood cutting board. And I love putting a variety of foods, some of their food, some um, phytonutrient foods or fiber rich foods, whatever it might be. And watching my dog have the ability to choose what he likes or she likes best um, one that gives me a clue to help understand if they actually are enjoying their food. Cause if they always leave like mm -hmm. one or two things, I know they probably aren't as interested in it. <laughs> um, which <laughs> I, idea. which I don't, I don't have that problem. My dogs are not picky. I know a lot of people do. No. Um, I even love to have like different proteins and kind of see like what they go for first. Mm -hmm. And that in itself, yep. literally just giving our dog an opportunity to be a dog, have aut autonomy, um, is highly enriching for them because they don't, Mo in most situations, they don't get that in their life. They're on a leash at all times. We're telling them what to do. We're putting them in the crate all the time. They don't really get the chance to just make decisions. And that in itself is really rewarding. It is. Uh, and, you know, the thing is when we're do going through our training, and this is something our trainer said all the time, he said, we don't want them to have to make hard decisions and we want to make it easy for them to make the right decision. Um, but, you know, let them think that they actually made the decision and then they're not frustrated uh, by making wrong choices and by not knowing what to do. Um, so that's kind of where your training comes in, but then giving them the ability to, and I, I like, the, I do that with my platters yeah. as well as like, I'll put things around it and see what they go for. Um, my little guy Forrest loves chicken hearts and turkey hearts. So if the grocery store ever runs out of chicken hearts and turkey hearts, I'm in big trouble. He I had to hand feed or force feed him for the first two years of his life. And now he loves hearts. And as long as there's a few pieces of heart on raw heart on his platter, he'll eat anything else on there. It's amazing. It took him two years to learn how to eat like a dog. That's pretty incredible. But he has hydrocephalus and he's, you know, he's a little challenged, yeah. but it took him two years to learn to eat like a dog. He would go days without eating if I didn't hand wow. feed or 
could actually put it in his mouth to get him started. He's an interesting little dude. But anyway, chicken hearts, great thing. Um, so, uh, so treats, I want to talk about treats because like we're, we're using these puzzle toys or mm-hmm. snuffle mats. Um, you know, clearly I don't have kibble in my right. house, so I know what I would put in those treats and snuffle mats. What do you put in there? So, I mean, for me, it's really a single or very limited ingredient treats. I know that we both love green juju, uh, freeze dried treats. They're made with like bison, bison liver, beef, salmon, very simple, limited ingredients. They're dry. Um, I love using parts of my dog's meal. I mean, you could take like, I got these, uh, uh, these dry dehydrated banana slices, which is literally just banana, broke those <laughs> up and put them in there. Green be- like canned green beans with no salt added. Gets a little wet and mushy, but but it can work. Um, but it's really just going simple, like frozen blueberries, frozen berries work really well too for a lot of these. Um, I think the key with them is just starting really slow and making sure, you mentioned this a second ago from your trainer, that with any of those enrichment toys or puzzles, that if in order to make sure that they're not going to become frustrated is making sure that you start slow and making sure they're successful in the beginning really, really quickly, like making the puzzle like level negative one and then move up the, like <laughs> make it super easy. So they get it right away. And then it's like, Oh wow, I can do that. Do that a few more times and then uh, progress the, progress the level. Yep. And I've seen some really great DIY puzzle things that people do where literally you'll take, you know, paper cups or plastic cups and turn them upside down with the treat under some of them and they, you know, figure out how to flip them over. I will say my Cocker Spaniel would probably take the cup and go play with that before he would even go for the treat because that's who he is. Uh, He likes to steal everything. I love that. that. (laughs) Yeah. I like um, DIY. That's what I was saying before is you really don't need to spend money. Like if you have cardboard boxes, literally you can start by putting, uh, the bowl of food for dogs who aren't super nervous and anxious inside the box. And so they have to put their head in it. It's actually very uncomfortable for dogs to have their head inside of something because they don't have the great peripheral vision. So like going in tunnels or putting their head in things, but it builds their confidence. So you could start with a shallow box and having them be able to do it without forcing it, of course, and making sure they're comfortable is just that in itself is enrichment or putting the box upside down and having the bowl on top of it. So they're feeding, they're eating on like a different surface, uh, is, is different in warmer weather. I love taking just little plates and breaking up their food. And then in the backyard, I don't have five acres, but I go and place them in different places around the yard. I don't use pesticides and, um, and they have to go find the, their food throughout the yard, do one dog at a time. Uh, and they love that because they get to go eat on the soil, explore and sniff and forage. We do Easter egg yeah. hunts with our dogs. And we put the eggs out around the yard and then send them out and they go find eggs and eat them. And it's, the, you know, for them, that's like the greatest sniffari ever. Um so it's just kind of a fun thing to do with them, but you could hide anything out there and let them all go have a good time yeah. looking. So uh, we are wow. out of time. I don't, these things way go by too so quick. Fast. I feel like I had so it's much, but this amazing. is good. Way <laughs> too quick. Yeah. So uh, if you want more information, Rachel has a ton of information. Her website is rachelfusaro.com. We'll put the links. Uh, She's got the same handle for Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. She made it really easy. And she also has a bunch of free guides on her website, uh, many of which were co-written with me. Uh, So tons of information. And uh, how often are you doing so? social media posts. Is it Multiple every day? Multiple times a day, every day. Yeah. Multiple times a day, every day. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> very educational, very educational. Lots of uh, really good guests. Um, so check out Rachel Fusaro. You will not be disappointed. Thanks Thank for listening. Thanks for listening to another great Naturally Healthy Pets episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for some helpful links. And if you enjoy the show, please be sure to follow and listen for free on your favorite podcast app.
We value your feedback and would love to hear from you on how we're doing. Visit drjudymorgan.com for healthy product recommendations, comprehensive courses, upcoming events, and other fantastic resources. Until next time, keep giving your pet the vibrant life they deserve. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. It is no substitute for professional care by a veterinarian, licensed nutritionist, or other qualified professional. You're encouraged to do your own research and should not rely on this information as professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Dr. Judy and her guests express their own views, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets neither endorses or opposes any particular view discussed here.